Squad Cars. General Motors and their dealer organization throughout Southern Africa proudly bring you the drama, the danger, the thrills, and the facts when the long arm of the law travels in squad cars. The story you're about to hear is true. Details are supplied from the official case files by the South African police. Only names and places have been changed to protect innocent people involved. Johannesburg, February the 8th, 2.35 p.m. Two men, John Norris and Nigel Swinburne, are driving in a car through Marshallstown. They reach a junction and turn left into Sour Street Extension. I hope the traffic's as comfortable as this when we're coming away. Oh, you're getting jumpy, are you? No, but all we need is to be stuck in the traffic. If we were stuck, anybody chasing us would be stuck too. Not a cop on a motorbike. We'll deal with that eventuality if and when it happens. There's always something goes wrong on a job like this. Some little thing. I'll pack it up, man. I've thought of everything. The one thing that didn't occur to me was the fact that you'd lose your nerve. I haven't. It's just that, well, you can't help thinking about things. Oh, you just concentrate on doing what I told you. That's all. Okay. Right. This is where we park the car, on the corner of Trump Street. Are you ready? Ready. All right. Let's go. Help me with a box from the boot. Okay. Now, don't rush it. It must look as though we do this every day, nice and casual. Okay. You got it? Yeah. Right. Right, just put it down in the road. That's it. Just let me close the boot. All right, we're off. Take your end of the box. Right. Now, you've got it straight. We go into the front doors if we own the place. We walk straight to the lift. We get in the lift and go down to the basement. Okay. Nobody will question us. From the basement, we go to where the stuff is. If anybody questions us, we've lost our way. We're looking for the toilet, right? Okay. Don't keep saying okay. You're irritating me, man. I'm sorry. Try and look like what you're supposed to be. You look scared stiff. Well, if I do, it's because I am. Oh, oh, I picked a fine partner for a job like this. I'll be okay. You'd better be. 2.43 p.m. Norris and Swinburne arrive outside the Colonial Mutual Bank. They don't hesitate. They walk straight in. They walk the length of the counter, behind which three tellers are busy with customers. At the end of the counter, the two men turn left and stop at a lift door on their right. Oh, good morning. I wonder if you can catch me. Right, press for the lift. Right. Try and look casual. I am. Hey, look out, somebody's coming. I'll handle it. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Mr. Princess, check these entries for me, please. Whew, the lift. What? Get in, man. Uh-oh. We're in. Oh, don't sound so surprised. I told you it would be like this. Now, take your time. You don't rush it. See, there's the vault. It's all barred and locked. Well, of course it is, you idiot. I told you it would be. Now, don't, don't keep on at me, man. Well, stop being so stupid, man. Think. If you keep on at me like this, I'll get confused. You just dare. You lass this job up and I'll kill you. I'm not going to lass anything up. Just tell me what to do. That's better. Now, we hide ourselves just around here to the left. What's happening? It's the manager and the accountant. They're coming down to put the money away. We just stand around the corner there to the left and we wait. Come on. Will they be armed? Oh, of course they will. Just the manager and the accountant? No, the three tellers will come down too. Gee, that's five of them. Well, we can handle them. Relax. Shh. Ten is the door. Just a beep, yes. Shay. <laughs> hey, come on, chaps. Come on. It's not wasting any time. Right. Let's open up, Robert. Right. The minute they're inside, we make our move. Right. Now, well, that's two. Now, come on, Darby. You're always behind, man. Come on. Now. Now, another second or two. Ah, that's it. All present and correct. Eh? Now, come on. Don't turn round, gentlemen. Who, who's that? I said don't turn round. We're armed and we'll shoot if one of Wait. you makes any movement at all. Just stand perfectly still and you won't get hurt. Now, put your hands out by your side. Stretch them out away from your pockets. That's it. Now, fill that box and let's get out of here. How? 
How did you get down here? Who are you? Don't turn around. Look, we're not offering any resistance to you. There's no need for you to be violent. If you behave yourself, we shan't be. Hurry up with that money. I'm being as quick as I can. Take the big ones, the twenties and tens. I am. Look, you, you won't get two blocks before the police arrive. I, I won't. I think we will. Who's going to call I, me? I am. I don't want any heroics, mister. Just take it easy. Right, the box is full. Right, close it up and drag it out into the passage. And, uh, and what are you going to do with us? I'm going to shut you in. But, but you can't. We, we, we'll suffocate. Oh, don't give me that. But I'm telling you, we will. You won't be in there long enough. I know what the setup is. Come on, let's go. Now, don't get any crazy ideas, you lot, because any sudden movements make me nervous. This gun's liable to go off. We'll just get this vault door closed and locked. Uh, aren't you taking the keys with you? No. We don't want that lot locked in there forever. Oh, let's go. Right. You take one end of the box. I'll take the other. Now, don't panic. We leave as calmly as we arrived. There's a fortune in this box. Do you realize that? It's working out just the way you said it would. You sound surprised. Well, it's one thing talking about a job like this. Pulling it off is something else altogether. Yeah. Come on, up we go. Now, we walk casually through the banking hall. No hurry. Right? <laughs> oh, just a few yards to the street of safety. What's that? What does it sound like, you fool? Come on, run! Come on! Come on! With the alarm bell clanging, Norris and Swinburne race for the door which leads to the street. It all happens so quickly that the members of the bank staff who observe the two men carrying the metal box between them only have time to react and shout after the fleeing pair. The robbers have reached the street before someone has the presence of mind to dial 3-0 for the flying squad. Police constable Heidegger speaking. Quick, we've been robbed. Send a card as quick as you can. Just a minute, lady. Where are you speaking from? The Colonial Mutual Bank, Selby Branch. It's just happened. They've just run out. Did uh, anybody see which way they went? Just a minute. Which way are they going? They're going down Voices. Are they in a car? They are. Why are they Yes, they're in a car, a white media. They're driving towards Boysons, down Boysons Road. Uh-huh. Uh, anybody hurt? I, I don't think so. Okay, right. We'll send someone around right away. Did they get away with a lot? Yes, a tin box full. 2.58 p.m. The constable who received the call at Flying Squad headquarters informs the warrant officer in charge of the control room on his way to the radio transmitting room. And while the constable is responsible for putting out a call for a squad car, the warrant officer phones the robbery squad. Lieutenant Robert Scarney. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Warrant Officer Hendricks speaking. It sounds like a big bank robbery, a colonial mutual bank, Selby branch. The two men with a metal box full of money have got away, and uh, they're heading towards Boysons. I'll get out there right away. 3.23 p.m. In spite of a prompt reaction to the call from the bank, the flying squad doesn't manage to intercept the bank robbers. And Lieutenant Lobbers Cockney arrives at the bank to interview the manager. Well, we, we all got the shock of our lives. We suddenly heard this voice telling us not to turn around. Was it a voice you recognized? Uh, no. Would you recognize it uh, if you heard it again? Oh, yes. Well, well I think so. Well, uh... Go on, Mr. McCormick. Well, I, I think we, we all realized how futile it would have been to try and resist because although the three tellers were armed, we were taken completely by surprise and they had the advantage. Just the two of them? Uh, yes. It's the most audacious thing I've ever encountered. <laughs> they certainly hit on a cunning, a cunning method of gaining access to a part of the bank where anyone other than staff members rarely sees. How did they do that, Mr. McDonald? Well, uh, they were dressed as lift mechanics. They were in overalls with the lift company's name embroidered on the back. You know, you, you must have seen them yourself. Yes. And uh, according to members of my staff, the box they were carrying bore the name of the lift company, too. I mean, who on earth would have thought that... Yes, you know... yes, yes, quite. So they uh, just walked in and made their way to the lift. Yes, exactly. And being dressed the way they were, nobody suspected anything. They're absolutely, very clever. Will you show me where this happened? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, this way. Well, uh, they, they came in the front door, over there. They walked this way and round the counter there. That brings them into a working area. Only staff members there. Now, if you'll just come with me. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, 
Uh, this is the, the lift we use to go down to the vaults, if you'll uh, just step inside. Thank you. Well, naturally, no one would think to question two lift mechanics apparently carrying a box of tools going to a lift. I mean, what could be more natural? Lifts are serviced regularly, aren't they? Well, uh, the vault's over there. Five of us came down. There are always five of us. The accountant, three tellers, and myself. We were locking away the cash. The two men must have been waiting over there. They waited for us to get inside the vault before they approached us. There was absolutely nothing we could do. <laughs> now I realized it was hopeless. They, they just helped themselves. Did uh, either you or any of your staff get to see the men's faces? Mm, no, not down here anyway. Uh, our backs were to them. The one held us up with a gun while the other stuffed the cash into what everybody had thought was a, was a toolbox. And I suppose they just locked you and we, when they'd finished? Y yes, yes. Uh, nasty experience for you. <laughs> yes, it, it wasn't very nice. Uh, Mr. MacDonald, who raised the alarm? Well, I did. Inside the vault, there's a mechanism for just such an occasion. I set it off as soon as I could gather my wits. <laughs> of course, by that time, according to other members of the staff, the two men were halfway across the banking hall. They only had a little way to run to reach the street. Who led you out of the vault? Oh, uh, Mr. Shimwell. He, he's our sub-accountant. The robbers had left the keys in the vault door, thank heavens. Mr. MacDonald, uh, a fingerprint expert will be arriving shortly. You've tested the cash boxes, the keys, the vault door and the lift for fingerprints, uh, which have possibly been left by the robbers. Uh, did you happen to see whether they were wearing gloves? Oh, well, I... I really couldn't say, Lieutenant. I, I'm sorry. Oh, that's, that, that's quite all right. You... You haven't got much to go on, have you? At face value? No. But it's amazing what turns up sometimes when you start digging. <laughs> well, I can't say I envy you. Oh, we've had tougher nuts than this to crack, Mr. MacDonald. <laughs> Fingerprint man and a photographer from the CID arrive at the bank, and Lieutenant Dobbs Cockney confers with the brigadier on the phone from the manager's office. Uh, what have you got to go on, Lieutenant? Well, I've uh, just dotted down the salient points, sir. Yes, let me hear them. Number one is that these two men knew exactly where to go in the bank. Therefore, it follows they must have had inside information, either from someone who's still employed at the bank here, or someone who's worked here in the past. Mm -hmm. Good go on. So, I've got the manager busy compiling a list of names and addresses of staff members who fall into the two categories I've just mentioned. Either present or ex-employees. Possibly people who have been transferred to other branches. Now, that's number one. I'm hoping that these boys were careless enough to leave some prints about the place. From what the manager and the other staff members have told me, these two birds were very confident, in fact, quite brazen. It's just possible they were overconfident. Yes, go on, go on. Now, uh, then there are these overalls they were wearing with the name of the lift people on the back. Now, I'm pretty sure that if I tried to obtain two sets of such overalls, I'd find it difficult, if not downright impossible. You can't just go to a lift company and say, look, I want to borrow a couple of pairs of overalls. They'd want to know what the devil I wanted them for. Questions would be asked. So it seems logical to presume that one or both of the men have or had access to such overalls, either now or in the not-too-distant past. And one of them has access, unless we find it a stolen vehicle, to a white milia. Now, when we start checking, I think, sir, we'll find either one or more common denominators among the facts I've just mentioned. Hey, tell me, uh, did anybody get a clear look at the pair as they left? Uh, yes, sir. The little girl who phoned us. Is she sure she'll be able to make a positive identification? Uh, she thinks so. Yeah. And uh, where will you start? Hmm? I think I'll begin with the 38 staff members, and I'll start right now. Yeah. All right, then. Keep me posted, Lieutenant. No, no relatives working at Endwood's, the lift people. Do you drive a white, Amelia? No. Have you seen one hanging around here, perhaps picking up a member of the staff? Mm, no. I don't talk about the bank's business. When I was employed, I signed an article of agreement in which I swore I wouldn't discuss any of the bank's business with people outside. The bank's very strict about that. 
now. I, I can't think of anything I've seen or, or heard lately that would help you. Do you know uh, anybody remotely connected with a bank who drives an Italian car? A 1500 white media? Uh, wait. Hang on a sec. Yes, Ernest Swinburne brother drives one. I've seen him a couple of times. Can I have Mr. Swinburne in next, please? Uh, good afternoon. Sit down. Uh, thanks. Cigarette? Uh, no, thanks. I gave it up. Huh, very wise. I've tried. Couldn't make it. Now then, tell me about yourself. Uh, well, uh, what do you want to know? Oh, anything. Where do you live? Uh, Kensington, Juno Street. What do you like doing uh, when you're not working? Uh, I read a bit, go, go to parties, listen to the radio, you know, that sort of thing. Haven't you got any hobbies? Uh, not really, no. Tell me about your family. W well, there's there, there's my mum and dad, my, my sister. Uh, she's married now, she lives in Bloemfontein. What does your brother do? M my, my brother? Yes. You've got a brother, haven't you? I yeah. What does he do for a living? Oh, uh, well, um, he, he works at Kendall's, uh, Gents Outfitters in Bree Street. Does he do well at that game? Yeah, yeah, all right. Oh, yes, he must do, if you can afford to run Amelia. Uh, what colour is it? Come on, I asked you a question. It's a white one. What's your brother's phone number at his work? I don't know. You mean you never phone him? No, no, I, I phone him, but I just can't remember the number offhand. Well, uh, we can soon ever do that. Here we are. We'll look, we'll look it up. Kendall's, okay? Okay. Okay. Ah, here we are. Kettles. Now, uh, how do I get a line on one of these things? You, you dial O. Right. Let's try. Hmm. It works. Now then. Double two. Double four. Five six. Uh, May I speak to the proprietor, please? Speaking. Does a Mr. Swinburne work there? Yeah. May I speak to him, please? Well, he's not here today. Um, he's off sick. Oh, thank you. Goodbye. Yes. Yes, I'll hold on. Thank you. He's coming. Oh, Mr. Swinburne, good afternoon. My name is Levis Cochney. I'm a police officer. Yes, yes. Uh, I've just been talking to your brother. He's told me everything. Just a minute. What, what are you doing? You be quiet. Uh, yes, yes, everything. Mm. I'll be sending someone around to have a little chat with you. So, uh, I wouldn't make any plans for the next few hours. Uh, just sit tight. Yes, yes. All right. I told you nothing. Afraid your brother's going to be upset, eh? I told him not to do it. <laughs> Who uh, did it with him? A, a man called John Norris. Where did we find him? I don't know. He, he's a pal of my brother's. Didn't your brother tell you he'd uh, be taking the day off today? Yeah. What did he say he was going to tell the boss? Well, he, he was going to phone him and say he was sick. Aren't you surprised that he went back to work? Yeah. There's obviously been a change of plans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what were they going to do? Well, they were going to hide the money till the fuss was over. Where? I don't know. Were they giving you a share? No, no, no. I, I told them I didn't want any of the money. They, they made me tell them things about the bank. Don't you think you've been a fool? Yeah. I'm very ashamed of myself. I should think this will cost you your job. But d d does the bank have to know? I'm afraid they do. Armed robbery is a very serious business. But they, they, they wouldn't have used the guns. They, they, they said they wouldn't. I think perhaps they would. Otherwise, uh, why take firearms at all? Well, they were just to frighten Mr. MacDonald and the others. I don't know, I don't know. You youngsters nowadays, how on earth did they think they'd get away with something like this? It seemed like a good plan. So you knew about it? I, I didn't want to know. I just couldn't help hearing. Where does this uh, uh, Norris work? He doesn't. Well, he must have worked at some time or other. Yeah, he, he, he was a lift mechanic, and that's where they got the idea. And the overalls. Yeah. Whose idea was it? Uh, Norris, it's, he was always telling my brother what to do. Oh, led him astray, eh? Yeah. What are your parents going to say about this? Well, they'll be upset. Is that all? 
Oh, I suppose so. I turned your hide for you. And I'd have done it a long time ago. Come on. But, but where, where are we going? To look for your brother. Look for... But, but you said that you spoke to him on the phone just now. Sally, you fell for one of the oldest tricks in the business. You mean you didn't speak to him? I pretended to. You fell for it and told me everything I wanted to know. Look, you, you, you mustn't tell my brother I told you. It's no good wriggling, my boy. You're in a jam. Let's go. 5.45 p.m. Lieutenant Labaskachny and Ernest Swinburne arrive at number 69 Juno Street, Kensington. The lieutenant informs Mrs. Swinburne of the fact that her son is in trouble. But what has he done? He's robbed a bank, Mrs. Swinburne. Robbed her? Nigel? Yes. Never. Oh, yes. There must be some mistake. It's true, Ma. I can't believe it. My boy. Is this them? Yeah. There's only one. Who is it? Uh, that's Nigel. Ernie? Ernie! Answer him. Uh, in here. Have you seen the paper? Oh. Nigel, this is a policeman. Uh, what do you want? I want you. But I, I haven't done anything. Uh, they all say that. I'm afraid I know everything. You told him. I didn't. Then how does he know? What's he doing here with you? Never mind that. Where's your pal? I don't know. Where have you dropped him? Uh, I dropped him in Hillbrow. Is that where he lives? Yes. Where? I don't know. I see. What have you done with the money? Find out. Oh, come on. Don't be silly. Can't you see you're up against it? I realize I'm caught, but it doesn't mean to say I've got to help you. Do your work for you. All right. I can wait. Mrs. Swinburne, I'm afraid your son's under arrest. What? Oh, what? Whatever shall I tell his father? You'd better tell him to get hold of a lawyer. He hasn't been at all well lately. This will kill oh, him. Oh, don't go all dramatic on me, Ma. That's no way to speak to your mother. Oh, you should hear him sometimes. I'm afraid he's beyond our control and has been for some time. Oh, you'll have me crying in a minute. No, that's enough. Just stop that. Oh, leave me alone, man. This one's never been anything but trouble to me since he got into his teens. And heaven knows we've tried with him. Don't you think you've caused your parents enough trouble? And what if I have? What's happening now is upsetting your mother very much. I've got eyes and ears, haven't I? You can put a stop to it. It's up to you. By telling you where the money is, I suppose. That's right. Well, I won't. All right. You're coming with me. Where to? Stand up. Well, where are you taking me? You're going to spend a little time in a cell. You'll cool off there. Ah. What? Whatever is that? It's a gun, Mrs. Swinburne. It's one of the toys your son's acquired now that he plays with the big boys. <laughs> February the 9th, 1.17 p.m. Robbery Squad Headquarters, Brixton. Nigel Swinburne, in spite of spending the night in a cell, has obstinately refused to talk. Lieutenant Labaskarkney has left him entirely alone. Now he chooses the moment before lunch is served to Swinburne as psychological. He's let into Swinburne's cell. Come on. Where are we going? To where your chum says you've hidden the money. Me? I suppose you're going to tell me it was him. I don't even know where it is. He said he was going to tell me when he got back. Back? From Marinza Marks. Uh, how do you spell his surname? Two R's. N-O-R-R-I-S. Norris. All right. Relax. Ten days later, February the 20th, 11.10 a.m. The border post at Kamati Port. Lieutenant Labaskachny is waiting in the passport control office. He receives a prearranged signal from one of the customs men. He goes over to the counter and speaks to the young man on the other side. John Norris, I'm arresting you in connection with the Johannesburg bank robbery on February the 8th. I advise you to come quietly. Huh. Just step this side of the counter, will you? Ah, been taking yourself a holiday, have you? That's just as well I did. You take the money through to LM? Oh, some of it. Enough to have a holiday and run the boat. Boat? <laughs> yeah. I bought a boat. Huh. 
And the rest of the money? Uh, you can have that back. Where is it? It's buried in a plantation near Baraguana. I thought we'd leave it till things got a bit better. You're being very sensible. I'm not a fool. I realize it's a fair cop. But I'd love to know how you found out. From Kamaji Port, Lieutenant Labaskachny and John Norris drove to where the money was buried. The money was in the metal box, the toolbox which bore the name of the elevator company. Except for a few hundred rand, the money was all there, as Norris had said. Ernest Swinburne, although no charges were preferred against him, was immediately dismissed by the bank. His brother, Nigel, and the ringleader, John Norris, were each sentenced to seven years' imprisonment at their subsequent trial. They prowl the empty streets at night, waiting, in fast cars, on foot, living with crime and violence. These men are on duty 24 hours out of every 24. They face dangers at every turn, expecting nothing less. They protect the people of South Africa. These are the men of Squad Cars. Listen again next Friday evening to another authentic story in our dramatic South African police series, Squad Cars. Brought to you by General Motors, makers of the biggest and most exciting range of cars, trucks and commercial vehicles in the world. Cadillac, Buick, Oldsmobile, Pontiac, Beaumont, Chevrolet, Opel, Holden, Vauxhall, Bedford, GMC and Ranger, South Africa's own car.